Welcome to Church Without Borders. I'm Scott Oberly, and this is Juggly's McGee. Uh, we are glad to. He's he's doing the show live out of a meat locker. Apparently, pretty cold down in Jacobville. And uh, anyway, we're glad to have you. Uh, we are going to be tackling the Valley of Dry Bones from the Book of Ezekiel this week. Awesome text. And but before we do, let's start with a word of prayer. God, for anyone who's wondered in some way, some level, can this life be fulfilled again? Can these bones live again? Can I get back out of, out from under whatever it is I'm facing, whether it's been financial or physical, something traumatic that's happened in our family, something with our health, something with the world. And we look and we say, life just isn't as, as it once was. And we're discouraged or in despair this Lenten season. We're overwhelmed and wondering, can anything good come back in my life? As Ezekiel was given this vision by you over a valley of his his dead and lost fellow Israelites as they're in captivity by the rivers of Babylon, Speak to us through this text. May your Holy Spirit move in us and through us as we wrestle with it and with our own lives in this Lenten journey, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, um, Will, I see that you've got, you've misplaced your mop or a coral reef on your head. We're glad to have you today. I know it's cold over there. Uh, If you want to give us a weather report and... uh, why don't we start with, um, I'll start with a little background and then you, you take us into the text a little bit. Um, so the Babylonians in their empire and conquest have come through and have annihilated both, uh, Israel and then Judea, uh, Judah. Um, they've taken Jerusalem. They've Israel tried to put together an alliance with Egypt, hoping that maybe, uh, by joining forces with another superpower, they could thwart or hold off the Babylonians. Didn't work. Uh, then uh, the Babylonians basically came, destroyed the Great Walls, took a city that many didn't think could be captured in the mountainous city of Jerusalem. Uh, they burned the temple, uh, laid waste to most of the cities and fortifications, and took away not all the people, but deported, uh, enslaved most of the men, women of wealth, uh, families of power, the upper class, the leaders of Israel. And so they left the poor. Uh, but you get texts like uh, Psalm 137, where it says, you know, as they're sitting by the rivers in Babylon and the Babylonians are saying to them things like, play us a song back from your old country, your old days, play us a merry song of Israel. And they say, we have no songs left to play. You've taken our music from us. We, you've taken any joy from us. You, we, we remember you saying as the walls came down, tear it down, tear it down, destroy it. Uh, we remember our women and children being taken off with, with hooks through their noses and our men butchered and slaughtered in the fields and our, our children, our babies and toddlers who couldn't make the journey being dashed against the rocks. And so you hear the psalmist in anger saying, bless is a day when your children, your babies will have their head beaten in, beaten in on the rocks. And I mean, it's just, just this really soul stifling dejection and anguish of a people who have lost their identity or wondered where is God in this, this loss of nation, this loss of peoplehood. And, and Ezekiel's with the, the remnants. Uh, you, you recall a book like Daniel, the, the young Israelites who are belonging to a family of the elite now have new names, Babylonian names. They're supposed to eat Babylonian f- food. They refuse to do so because they want to keep with the foods of their kosher law. And that conflict between new empire and old identity and that battle for who they are, even though they've lost their land, they've lost the, the central focus of uh, where they've worshipped God. And, uh, and this is where we meet 
Ezekiel today in Ezekiel 37. So we have the beginning of this passage where it says that the hand of the Lord came upon me and it brought me out by the spirit and set me down in the middle of the valley and there was lots of bones. So this is the this is the claw game at the bowling alley, right? That you put the quarter in and here comes the hand of God. And it says that it, it sets upon him and it plucks him up and it puts him down in this valley and bones. And so whether this is a trance or a vision or, or whatever it is, on the one hand, Ezekiel here is saying, I'm not entirely sure how I got here, but he believes that God brought him here. And I don't know if you've had any experience with that, where you feel like God has brought you to a place and maybe that's good and encouraging. It feels like God is acting as a guide or maybe it's a scary type of thing that somehow life has gotten out of control. There's a snowball effect that's gone on. You go in for a a checkup at the hospital and it turns into a dire diagnosis. What starts as a amicable discussion with someone turns into a shouting match. Ezekiel finds himself plucked up, set down. And as he looks around, he's surrounded with this image of destruction. He's in a valley of bones. When we talk about in Psalm 23, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he's there. I'm in the shadow of death, this place that used to have life, maybe this place of of conflict, and now he is in its shadow. And in Psalm 23, it says, even though I'm there, even though I find myself in this place, I will fear no evil. And so this is how we are introduced to this very famous section with Ezekiel. He He's not sure quite how he gets there, but he believes that God is the one bringing him to this place. And though it is a place that could be quite scary, that could be very poignant and eliciting sad and regretful feelings. This is the crossroads that he and maybe we choose when we find ourselves in this place. I will choose to not fear the evil. I will make the decision that though I'm not sure why I'm in this moment, in this place, surrounded by what could be scary things, I am going to make the decision to not be afraid and to know that God is with me. Maybe God has led me to teach me, to show me something in this place. Uh, Something that jumps out at me from the page is he calls him son of man. Now, as a lot of readers of scripture, you might say, well, I've heard of that before. And it's usually like in Matthew's gospel when Jesus is speaking about himself. Uh, You will see the son of man seated at the right hand of God. And the, and the clouds coming again. Um, but Son of Man is often used of kings or prophets in the Hebrew Bible. And in this case, it's used of the prophet Ezekiel, who's going to be a mouthpiece, in this case, to the, the fallen of Israel. To whether it's a literal people or it's a the dreams that have been broken. It's a metaphor for the people he'll be ministering to. Back in exile along the the waters of the Babylon River, he uh, he says interestingly, tell them that I will breathe life into them, the ruach of God, the breath of God, and then I will knit them together, sinews and tenion, tendons to bone. And I find this really interesting because when Ezekiel prophesies to the bones it's actually the exact opposite in terms of the order in the way these things actually happen and in essence in his dream as he speaks you know these bones it's kind of like if it was hollywood i could just see you know a femur and a, a humerus kind of rattling together on the ground a little skull you know moving around and then all of a sudden you know like out of something in a terminator or something and then all of a sudden these bones come back up clack, 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 into a skeleton and Flesh and blood start coming on them, but they're just inanimate meat bags, if you will, just kind of standing there. They're not doing anything. They're not. There's no real life in them. And I, I have looked at that often to, as as kind of a metaphor to say 
what's lacking here in these people is the spirit of God. The breath of life has not come into them. And to me, this kind of speaks to me in a different way in the text to say, you could be, you can exist in flesh and blood and still not be alive with God. You can be existing, going through the road, roots wrote the rote memorization and, and routines of daily life, the ins and outs of your routines and still be missing and still be hollow inside from that thing. That is the spirit of God that fills you. And the people of Israel have lost, uh, if it was Austin powers, their mojo, they've lost their will for being, they've lost their, their drive of faith because everything they've, had everything they perceived to have has been taken from them. And it's going to take more than a pep talk. It's going to take a promise from God through the mouth of Ezekiel to reignite them, to give them that spirit, that will, that drive, that life again. But the other thing that I think sticks out to me, bro, is Ezekiel just, just chapters before, about 10 chapters before in this text is talking about you know, it's not just that Babylon destroyed Israel. It's it's that the people of Judah became lax and greedy and self-centered. And they brought a lot of this, at least in the prophet's mind, they brought a lot of this on themselves. They've reaped what they've sown. They've they've some of their decisions and their greed has led to their own destruction. And I think Ezekiel's a little skeptical when God says, Can these bones live again? If even if they could, wouldn't, wouldn't the people still make the same mistakes they've always made? And so maybe he's a little skeptical. Maybe he's a little dejected himself. Maybe he has a little bit of the prophet Elijah in him saying, I'm the only one left around here who gives a darn, and I'm all by myself. Thoughts on that? Well, yeah, that could be. I guess I looked at the, you know, the, there's some strange phrasing in this passage and one of it is that he talks about like how dry the bones are it's like man these bones are dry and it's it's almost like a commentary of they're so unrecognizable from their human form they've been there for so long this valley is bereft of life and animation it drives home the point that if they were to have new purpose or reclamation that it would have to be through something miraculous. And so I thought of the lamb shank bone that our Jewish brothers and sisters celebrate at Passover, this dry bone that is meant to connote sacrifice. And I thought about, gosh, how every major story in Hollywood and children's tales have the superhero as born from the sacrifice of a mentor or family member. You know, this is Spider-Man from Uncle Ben. This is Superman being sent away from exploding Krypton with, from his parents. This is Mufasa saving Thimba from the rampaging wildebeest. This is Luke Skywalker who can escape because of Ben Kenobi's sacrifice. This is Jesus on the cross. And so Ezekiel, plucked by the bowling claw placed in this valley surrounded by a grisly scene that perhaps brings to mind this notion of who has gone before him to ask the question what sacrifices were worth it for this moment as i find myself in this valley and maybe this is a question we ask ourselves as I find myself here in this place that feels so dead, so empty, so hopeless, this wilderness of Lent, what have the sacrifices before me meant? And if that's the case, that almost makes sense then when God says, mortal, can these bones live again? And Ezekiel gives kind of a cheeky answer. He's like, oh God, you know, you know. <laughs> And it's this dodging question where God's asking this penetrating question of faith. As you stand in this moment, as you are surrounded by symbols of sacrifice, of decay, of the worst parts of your history, of failed and unrealized hope and promise, do you still live in a way that you think there is hope? Or... 
is this all for show? This is God asking Adam and Eve in the garden, where are you? Knowing perfectly well where they are. This is uh, Jesus asking Pilate who he is. And, and Pilate says, you know, the son of God. And Jesus says, you have said so. These rhetorical kind of penetrating questions throughout scripture where God seems really interested to say, in your current situation, as tough or challenging as it seems, are you ready for your faith to live into hope? And I've got more on that, but Scott, I want to throw it back to you and, and have your thoughts. No, I, I think you know. I really, uh, I really think that was solid. I, am I coming cl- through clear or do I sound like I'm in a uh, maelstrom here? Okay. You sound All fine. Right. <clears throat> you look yeah. like you haven't bathed for a couple weeks. All right. Well, that then the, the illusion is, is perfect. Anyway, I think about this text in context because, you know, hearing it in, um, in Downers Grove uh, is different than hearing it on the Cherokee Reservation. Uh, it's different than hearing it in Pine Ridge, a people who have had their land, uh, had their identity uh, decimated. And can these, I wonder how it would be heard um, through first people's ears. I wonder how it would be heard in Ukraine today. Can these bones live again? And in a piece of it, you know, that language of bone, you brought up the, the lamb bone. Uh, at the Passover, and I think about uh, one of the commentators was writing about Laban and Jacob, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, kinship, and he talks about this this blood and soil will have life again, and was talking about, well, that sounds very ethnocentric. It sounds like the rebuilding of a nation, a national identity, which could lead to ethnocentricity, could lead to nationalism and a dangerous place of the text that because I am of your people, we're going to rise again at any cost. Israel become great no matter what the cost or expense. So it could actually have a shadow side. And I want to speak to this a little bit because to me, that flesh and blood, that kinship is a part of the text. It's part of the national identity of Israel. But without the spirit, there is no resurrection hope. Without God moving into these bones, this lifeless people of despair, these broken people, whether it's Israel or it's us, whatever that brokenness takes shape in, without the spirit, And the spirit is reiterated. That's the thing that stands out to me 10 times in 14 verses, the wind and the spirit and the breath of God and without the breath. And then God breathed into them. And with the breath, they stood up and they were alive again. Um, It it takes a spirit to move the mountain. It takes a spirit to bring back. And, uh, and I, so I think the context is important, but I also think identifying that the shadow side of the text, this isn't because there are, Today in the United States, there are those who want to say Christians are the victims. We have to take back, even if it means getting violent, even if it means we have to kill for it. I've heard this these words. Then to get back to the moral high ground. And that's a dangerous thing. And it's not what this text is about. This text is about the living God bringing back to life. It's why it's paired this week in the lectionary with Lazarus, come out of your grave, and that Deus Profundus, Psalm 130, out of the depths. When I've got nothing left, I cry out to you, my God, hear me out of the depths. Yeah, and this notion of Ruach goes back before Ezekiel. This is at the beginning of our Genesis story when it says the world was a formless void It's God's breath, the ruach, that goes over the waters to create order from chaos. And this is the kind of symbology that I think we have here. This is the ruach in Exodus 15, when the people of Israel are escaping from Pharaoh's army. And it is God's breath that helps separate the waters and leads them to a place of liberation. It's this active, non-passive, life-giving moment. Um, It's breathed into Adama, Adam, in the story of humanity, this not only animating force, 
but fully creative, fully functional, fully restorative kind of breath. And, you know, a lot of people call this passage Valley of Dry Bones or whatever. If you're familiar with the video game Mario Brothers, one of the names is Dry Bones. And you can knock out almost any character in the game. But when you jump on Dry Bones, he crumbles into a pile and then he comes right back up. He's reanimated and keeps on going. And so in this passage, as Ezekiel finds himself in this valley, and there's all this discussion about what should be done. Okay, so he finds himself maybe in the shadow of death or guilt or failure of the Israelite people. Maybe there's this notion of what has been sacrificed already and what does it mean? And then God puts this question to him. Do you really think that in the midst of despair, there's still hope? Then there's this two-part formula that comes up, and one of it is the ruach. One of it is breathe, and the other part is prophesy. And for me, I look at that verb and say, okay, what is God asking of Ezekiel? What is God asking of us to prophesy? It almost feels ironically inappropriate. I want you to give a sermon here in this valley of dead bones. I want you to start to to prophesy to no one else except me. Just start speaking aloud and see what happens. But prophecy is rooted in a speaking of hope. True prophecy is that when you speak not just of things to come, but of good things to come. The prophecies of Scripture are telling the people, this is what might happen. And guess what? God's going to be ahead of you right now. Wherever you at, I'm, I'm sharing this prophecy because God is still to come. God is the not yet, not only the alpha, but also the omega. So as you look forward to where you are, God is still there coming to meet you. And so the encouragement to Ezekiel is in the midst of this valley, in the midst of this deadness of sacrifice, of guilt, of whatever it is, I want you to speak hope. And with the ruach, I want you to breathe. I will contribute my breath, but I want you to breathe. And I think about as we look at our own valleys, as we find ourselves surrounded by the deadness of the past, as we look and try to make sense of the sacrifices and conflict that has happened before us, and we wonder, was it worth anything? Does it make any sense? Was God truly there with me? The encouragement is, What you can do right now is to speak in hope, to choose not to be afraid, but to speak in a hope and say, I know that God is yet before me. I know that God is waiting for me as I continue on my journey. And maybe part of our breath, our breathing exercise, it's not that active ruach that animates and changes everything. That's God's job. But maybe our breath is a exhaling, a letting go of what we've drug with us into the valley. It's an exhaling to say, God, I know that life is still up ahead. I know that whatever I see has so much less potential than what you see it as and that you have the power My faith dictates that what I understand is not the be-all, end-all, but your breath can reanimate and give new life. The last thing I would leave with is uh, from one of my favorite theologians, Rocky Balboa, uh, who, I don't know, is maybe Rocky 1000, who said, uh, after he's talking about the failures of his prodigy and the death of his wife, he says, uh, there's no opponent that the punch is harder than life. And when you're knocked down to the canvas, the only question is, are you going to get up? Um, and the, the reason I, th- I throw that out there is because God is a God of life. The prophets are called to bring people, connect people back to the God of life, even in their despair whatever the despair is, whatever the the place of hopelessness, of of brokenness, whether they feel overwhelmed by the world around them and their prospects for the future, or it's personal and individual in that moment. 
And so, however this text meets you, I think that phrase of can these bones live again means different things in different pro, uh, different contexts. Yes, William, Will, yes, Pastor Verdine. I think there's also a jump here that is purposeful. The ending of this passage talks about how God is going to open up your graves. And that's meaningful because where Ezekiel finds himself is, yeah, a valley of death, but apparently nothing's buried. They aren't, they aren't graves. These are just bones lying around that are, that are seen. And those bones still have that potential. They still have this reanimation, the ruach. Maybe they have the, the possibility to be released as we exhale. Um, as we prophesy and speak hope, but it's almost like God goes a step further to say, okay, in your present situation, what you can see, these bones around you, yeah, you understand that, that I am still working. But then God goes a step farther and he says, but also for the things that feel so buried and done, I will open up those graves. This is Jesus in the tomb for three days. These are the graves of pessimism that we have just decided will never get better. These are the graves of stress and worry that we find ourselves so weighted down by and say, this is just my reality. God can't affect this. God says, not only the things that we see, these valleys that we find ourselves in as we understand sacrifice or guilt, that can be redeemed. But the things that you have buried down and think are just so dead and so untouchable by God, I have the power and the will to open up those graves as well. And so this moment from when we first meet Ezekiel in this very pessimistic and dire place, perfect for the season of Lent, comes full circle with this understanding that where you are right now, where you are going, and the things that you thought are completely dead and useless all have the power to be brought up and used for good. God has the will to change and flip those pieces on their head for the glory of the kingdom. So take heart and breathe out and prophesy a word of hope because this is what the God of all creation is all about. That's awesome. And a shameless plug for the song. Uh, I think it's uh, Dry Bones by Varnador, or Vanador, uh, which speaks exactly to what Will was just saying. And in a homage to Dry Bones, I don't know if this is coming through a little Mario Brothers action for you, but uh, for those of you who grew up playing the game, we're glad that you join us for Church Without Borders. Thank you for uh, journeying with us this Lenten season. We are glad to have you as uh, part of our online community. And uh, if it's not been a great day, go out and make it one. Uh, we're glad to have you with us and have, a, have an awesome day. <laughs>